This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, 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 hello. Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. And today we have some really great news. <laughs> we have a very dear friend, probably the most popular guy, in, in at least in my genre of macroeconomics over YouTube. And he's a, I mean, we've been a friend for a long time now, and it's George Gammon. And he is the only guy that Peter Schiff is jealous of because George has, <laughs> George, Peter, Peter's a friend of ours. So <laughs> P- Peter can't understand why George has more followers than Peter. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> And so it's going to be a very interesting show because this is a very exciting time. So any comments, Kim? Well, George is, uh, produces the Rebel Capitalist podcast, so listen to that. Listen to that podcast. It's excellent. But the funny thing is, you know, we're, we get in the studio and we're ready to start the show yeah. and, and we're just talking, talking, talking. What about oh, this? What yeah. about this? What about this? So this could be a 25 thousand hour show yeah, with exactly. you, George. Uh, yeah. Well, so there's so gonna, much we're just going gonna, on. Oh, man. Yeah, we're just going to really scratch is. the surface. So welcome. I'm so happy to have you here. We're so honored that you that you came oh, thank, to the studio thank you for having me i'm yeah, really yeah, excited yeah. it's great to be here i was gonna say there's three <laughs> <laughs> so you've been you do not have a really a permanent residence you travel from city to country to country constantly yeah, i mean it, it's technically puerto rico but i've spent a lot of time in medellin colombia since 2015 because i've got a team of people there we do a lot of real estate investing but uh i'm agnostic mm-hmm. I just go where I think I'm gonna enjoy spending time. And like uh, our mutual friend, Andrew, Andrew Henderson says, you, know, you go where you're treated best. Yep. And uh, I think you need, especially today, oh, God. you need to be very flexible with, uh, with your residency where you live. And um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's, that's yep. going on in the developed world. And I think that if people aren't cognizant of that, that uh, they could be a victim and um, not even know what hit them. You know, it right. comes very fast. So we need a place to uh, start in on. So um, George is from Portland. Kim is from Portland. And Kim and I lived up there in Portland for a while. And he was, you know, all we saw was a rioting on the screen and all yeah. this. But you were there, back there, before the rioting started. Mm-hmm. And would you mind explaining kind of the culture of what was going on in Portland prior to the rioting? Yeah, well, yeah, Starbucks, I think you were at. Yeah, it sure. It was nothing like when I grew up. I mean, that that would not have flown back then. But basically what happened is I was there for a few days for a friend's birthday. So during the day, I was going into the local Starbucks, uh, a few of them downtown in, in nice areas and uh, just trying to answer emails and get some work done. And this was maybe three years ago or so. And um, there's a lot of home. That's the first thing that struck me when I went there from the airport is just the amount of homeless. I mean, there's just camps. I mean, you, they're, they're lining the sidewalk. And I guess there's, you know, back when I was growing up there, that that would not have been allowed. But now I guess it's 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 allowed. They can just go wherever and they can, I mean, it, it gets very unsanitary as well because they're not only living there, but they're using that as, as their facility if they need to use the restroom or, you know, it was right out there in the open. So that's the first thing that strikes you. But then you go into the Starbucks and you're like, okay, well, at least maybe here I'm going to be kind of left alone. But sure enough, you know, they're coming in, they're using the restroom. And when I was there, they're coming in to use the restroom to shoot up drugs. And they would be in there for a half hour. Then as soon as one person left, the next person would come in and you really didn't even have an opportunity to use the restroom. And the employees there were scared to say anything or to kick them out because they knew that the police wouldn't back them up. And then that Starbucks would have to go through this big PR nightmare if there was an altercation. So what ends up happening is if, if someone came in that was just completely belligerent or just whacked out on drugs, you know, screaming, just who knows what they're doing. And I saw this right in front of my eyes. The only way that you could get them out is if the patrons just stood up and said, hey, you know, some of the guys in there, like myself, that are maybe a little bit bigger, say, hey, buddy, you got to hit the road. You got to get out of here. And you would have to be the Starbucks bouncer, if you will. And uh, when I was there, I had to kick out at least two or three individuals that were that were quite literally scaring the, the, the people in there. And um, that's what Portland's turned into. 
So anyway, Kim, you grew up there, right? What was it I like did. when you grew up? Oh, it was like it was like beautiful city. Mayberry RFD it was yeah. like yeah, well, Opie Opie Taylor. Um, no, yeah. it was it's a beautiful city. When I was there, it was a beautiful city, very safe. Um, never ever felt fear uh, being downtown. Downtown was a beautiful redeveloped area. It was gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous, yeah. especially I, in the summer. And we still have a condo up there. Yeah, we, we have bought our first house up there, and so we love Portland. So when I saw it burning on the news, and so it's interesting that you're from there. Yeah, but so, that's what that's what we're going to get into today is kind of what's behind all of this disruption in the economy and yeah. homelessness and all that. But George, please give us a little background of how you came to be here. I understand you're a Rhodes Scholar and A student in high school. <laughs> <laughs> Not even close. I almost flunked out of high school. I think that's something I did. that. that, that <laughs> yeah. So you were able to accomplish a lot more than I did in high school. You're able to actually flunk out and make it happen. So we have that in common. But uh, I've always been an entrepreneur, and uh, some of the things I did worked out. Some of them yeah. didn't. Uh, you just kind of shoot first and ask questions later. And I'm definitely guilty of probably having a little bit too much confidence in my own decision-making ability. And uh, I retired in 2012. And I kind of had enough. I wanted to explore the world and, and maybe have a how, little more how freedom. How old were you at 2012? 38 years old. 38. Was it primarily real estate that allowed no, you to? No, I'd never been in real estate. Drugs. Okay. No, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, at a bouncer company, He's, right? It was a Starbucks bouncer selling. for Starbucks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, no, I'd never been in real estate. I was just an entrepreneur, just started businesses. And um, what kind of business was most, They're usually around sales and marketing. The last business I had was a convention business where we do these large conventions three to four times a year, maybe five to 6,000 people. I'm glad you're out of that business now. Huh? Yeah, you know what? I was thinking about that the other day when this whole thing hit with the virus. Yeah. I'm like, boy, if I'd still be in that business, I'd really be struggling yeah. right now. We know a some of friends yeah, are. that are, there. that's their business, is big seminars all over the world, and they are yeah. dead in the water right now. Yeah, so in 2012, retired, and then I needed to figure out a way to invest my own money. So that's when I went down the Milton Friedman rabbit hole and Thomas Sowell, who are my two favorite Thomas economists. Thomas Sowell's the greatest boy. Yeah, oh, he's amazing. Jesus. Absolutely incredible. African-American economist mm -hmm. who says it like it is. Oh, that's, to, yeah, to say the least. Yeah. That's for sure. And then uh, I started studying Jim Rogers and Mark Faber and Jim Rickards, a lot of the guys that, yeah. you know, a lot of your buddies. And uh, that kind of took me to the the philosophy that I wanted to buy things when they are cheap and sell them when they're expensive. Pretty straightforward. And so that took me to real estate in 2012 because it was extremely Timing was good. cheap. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I looked at a chart going back to 1900 and it went all the way down to its historic trend line. So I knew that was the time to get in. So I've been investing in real estate ever since Where? all over, but most initially in the United States in but the Midwest, cities? Kansas city, Kansas city. Yep. Kansas city. I was just there last week. Yeah. And then uh, went, uh, now I've been doing it in South America, but I'm definitely a real estate guy uh, at the core. But like where I live, I'm agnostic. If I see stocks or bonds around the world that are cheap, I'm happy to go in there and, and start kicking tires. That's for sure. You were talking before we started the program about Dubai as a, as a real estate play. You think yeah. that's a good, a good place to be? Yeah, because they've just been crushed their real estate market peaked out in 2015. Yeah, when I, when I was there, I told them that, man, this baby is coming down. They go, no, real estate always goes up, you know, yeah. Burj Khalifa and all this stuff. I said, no, you guys are, don't stand too close to that building. No, it's a highly cyclical market, yeah. but now it's been going down for several years. And it, it there's a couple By things. By the way, those are the floating islands you guys see on, on Yeah, the, the pond, yeah, you yeah. got it. So you've got a couple things there. They, they, their real estate market's been in a downtrend, a severe downtrend. I told but them. In addition to that, <laughs> then they had oil go to negative forty dollars a barrel. So that wasn't negative. Good for their, wow. Well, you know, back in that was just uh, oh, right. in the states oh. here. But uh, yeah, that didn't like Jim Rogers says. Not like you could buy gas for you know negative ten cents right. a gallon or anything. Right. <laughs> but uh, oil really got hit. That hits their economy. And then what they did is they were preparing for twenty twenty to have this big world fair in Dubai for almost the entire year. And so they really overbuilt oh, their housing gosh. stock in 1919 to prepare for that. Oh my gosh. And then COVID comes in and just bam, knockout punch. So, you know, we like to buy when there's blood in the streets. And uh, I think Dubai is interesting right now. So that's why I'm, I'm checking it out. 
So anyway, we're going to talk about this thing called the Cantillon effect. Would you explain what that is? Yeah, so the Cantillon effect is when governments or central banks print money, it doesn't go to everyone in the population equally. It first, it goes to the insiders, and the who, political insiders. Who, so who would be the political insiders today? Clintons. The Clintons, it would be the individuals at the World Economic Forum. So if you watch any of their videos, you know, they've got this whole big push for a great reset yes. where they're calling COVID a quote unquote opportunity. Those are yes. their words, not mine. That's, that's what Jane wow. Fonda said last night. What, what's that? Jane Fonda said this is an opportunity. COVID is the best thing that ever happened to him. Yeah, that's, that's because their- Because now the left can get in and um, blow out the capitalists. Yeah, that's basically yeah. their push. Yeah. But these are the insiders that are buddy buddy with the people, the central bankers, who are printing the money. They're closest to it. So they get it and it hasn't got out into the economy to create inflation in either consumer prices or assets. So their purchasing power, they get the maximum benefit from this money printing where by the time it gets down to the average Joe, if it ever does, prices have gone up so much that their purchasing power is less than it was before they printed the money in the first place. Well, would you agree there's two things that happen is that when it's called crony capitalism? Oh, absolutely, yeah, and so corporatism. You get all this money, the CEOs get it, they buy back the shares of their stock, which is That's a right. horrifying thing. But meanwhile, the, so the asset prices go up, <clears throat> yeah. like mom and pop or the homeless on the street, yeah. their consumer price index goes up. Yeah, that, that can happen. Or if they do buy assets, you know, they're buying at the top and the people selling are the insiders that had the money in the first place. They're selling, they're selling all the game. way up, right? So in, in my opinion, and I'm not saying that the, the quote unquote insiders that we talked about, those that group of people are actually doing this, but if you think about their incentive structure, they would be incentivized for the economy to do poorly and, to, and for the economy to actually collapse. They would be incentivized to promote things such as negative interest rates. Because what that does is that destroys the banking system or the economy. The more the economy is destroyed, the more money printing the central banks will do, therefore the richer the insiders get. Which, which explains why the stock market keeps going up, 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 even though people have lost jobs, businesses have shut down, the economy is in the toilet, but the stock market still does great. Yeah, you know, Kim, I had a great chart the other day in one of my videos where I showed the uh, Buffett indicator. And if you guys don't know, that, that's the market cap of the stock market compared to GDP, right? And we, the only time that GDP has ticked down was back in 2008, the GFC in this chart I had. And it went down just slightly, but of course the stock market went down by 50%. Now it's the only time that I've ever seen in history where GDP has collapsed, but the stock market has skyrocketed. Right. It's gone the complete opposite direction. So there is no relationship whatsoever between the stock market and the real economy right now. I like this. This, this is a great time, man. <laughs> anyway, we're really honored to have you here, George. You know, it's, it's fantastic. Quick question. Uh, why did Buffett sell his bank shares? I, I, um, Jim Records was, we just interviewed him. And that was my question. Why is he buying gold? And why is he selling bank shares? Well, I mean, if we really want to go down that rabbit hole, if we, <laughs> if we look at the, what we were talking about with the Cantillon effect, and if he knows the global elites are trying to destroy the banking system, by pushing negative interest rates, obviously Buffett wants nothing to do with that. What, what do you see the future of banking being? But, well, I, I think there's a lot, it's all a game of probabilities. There's no certainties. But I think one probability could be if they start to ban cash, which I think they will, then we, uh, if you look at the Banking for All Act, that's basically where we have accounts with the Federal Reserve. If we, the people, all have accounts with the Fed, then there's really no need for the banking system. There, there is no banking system. There is only one central bank. That's it. And so if, if we kind of take it to its logical conclusion, if, if the Fed has a balance sheet where, where basically they can take an infinite haircut, what that means is if, they, if the Fed loans you money and you don't pay it back, it doesn't matter. They don't have a profit and loss. So they can start to distribute money I mean, you want to talk about the Cantillon effect. They can start to distribute it, not to whomever they want, but how they want. So instead of giving you a mortgage 
based on your credit score or your ability to repay the loan. They can do it based on your social score. So well, if, if you're did not you, part did you of, wear your mask today? Do you have a exactly, vaccine shot? Exactly. Did you cross the street? Did That's you, right. Did you bow? I'm screwed. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> so the mask, they're, they're talking about a crypto dollar. You basically, it's like, it's like a, a digital, thing? yeah, it's a digital dollar. So let's think about this. We all have a, a bank account, we'll just say B of A, Wells Fargo, whatever. And you get your bank statements every single month and then you reconcile that with QuickBooks or whatever. So now if we had a bank account with the Fed, then the Federal Reserve or the government would see every single one of your transactions, especially if there was no cash whatsoever. Right. So then every transaction had to go through the Fed or the government. So the amount of power that this would give them that's is basically control. unlimited. <laughs> that's that's like, really totalitarianism, communism and all that. I think it's even worse. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's electronic. It's yeah. Invisible. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not saying that this is happening. I, so, you know, lose sleep or but I'm saying you, you got to start thinking about these things and, and think how these people and the, the system itself, what the incentives are to think of potential probabilities. So you can make sure that you're not one of those victims we talked about. It's you're, you can either be prepared or be a victim. It's your choice. Well, that's a You're right on target here. That's a my next book is called The Infinite Returns. And I was doing the Buckminster Fuller. I built the Jesus Dome. He says, we are designed to be the architects of the future, not as victim. Yeah, right. And so when we come back from this program here, we're going to be talking to George Gammon, like he's one of the hottest guy on social media in the macroeconomics <laughs> field. The Rebel Capitalist Rebel podcast. Capitalist show. The Rebel Capitalist. And, but my, I, you're my go-to guy when I want to know something. I just go through, I just scroll through your, uh, all your YouTube talks and I have, I have a question on something. I just go to you because you'll explain it to me. In simple, three simple terms. <laughs> so when we, when we come back, I want, I want to talk about what a person can do yes. to Great. not be a victim. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. And the good news is we have the famous George Gammon <laughs> of the Rebel <laughs> Capitalist Podcast right in our studio with us. Once again, you can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes or Android and YouTube. And please leave us a review when you listen. And all of our podcasts are archived at richdadradio.com. We archive them because we have nothing to sell but share our information. So if you listen to this program again, and I would strongly recommend it, you'll learn about the Cantillon effect and homelessness and what's going on in the macro economy. Listen to this again, you'll learn twice as much, but more importantly, listen to this program with friends, family, and business associates and discuss and your retention rate, your intelligence will skyrocket. Yeah. So we're talking to George Gammon. Before we get into what can a person do? Yeah. yeah. Where are you going to hide? You know, I mean, George, George lives in a wheelie. They keep some board behind, holes behind it. <laughs> <laughs> what I love about George is. Like a stick and uh, what was it? The, the stick and little scarf in the back. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but George and I are on our way and Kim, we're on our way to Jekyll Island. Now, for those who may not know this, but Jekyll Island is where the U S federal reserve bank was so-called started in 1913 on Christmas yeah. Eve. And the, and Jekyll Island is infamous, and we're going there for the Red Pill Expo. And the reason we're going is one of the greatest, one of my heroes is uh, G. Edward Griffin. Yeah, yeah. He's the author of The Creature from Jekyll Island. And so we're going to what's called the Red Pill Expo, which is starring Keanu Reeves. <laughs> yeah. And it's about, are you taking the blue pill or the red pill? <laughs> and most people are on the blue pill. So George and I and Kim will be at Jekyll Island at the Red Pill Expo. You have a chance to go to it. It's worth going to. It'll blow your mind of what we're not being told. I think yeah, today, I'm too, you can to go it. virtually today um, th to the one coming up this weekend, too. If yeah. you can't get there in person, you can watch virtually. Yeah. So why? How? How? what's your objective for going to the Red Pill with uh, Griffin? Well, they wanted me to go out there and speak about the Great Reset. Oh, we were okay. talking about what the World uh, Economic Forum's agenda that we were referring to earlier. So I'm going to talk about that. And then I'm going to talk about how you can understand what they're doing and leverage that into your own investment portfolio to actually profit from it. Well, the first time I went to my fourth one, I'm going to the, the first, the first time I went to it, they said the red pill expo was a white supremacist organization. <laughs> oh, geez. 
And I said, I'm not even white. How could I be here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that's how bad the media is. They don't even know what they're reporting on. I know. Yeah. But, but anyway, we're going to be talking about what can I do? You know what I mean? We're talking about how some guys have a uh, Winnebago mobile home yeah. ready to go in their driveway in case they have to move quickly so they don't want to be like in Portland or in the wildfires of California. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. You can get out of Dodge now. So what can a and, person do? Okay. And George, let me just a ask, you have multiple passports. No, I'm in the process of getting my Colombian passport. So I've got resident, I've got my residency visa. Okay. And so it's, 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 it's kind of the same, but I'm in the process of getting them. I was, I still only have one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Which but is, you, which is not ideal. I'm, I'm doing change. everything I can to make sure that changes. Yeah. You know? Is and that, that Puerto Rican? No, Puerto Rican's the same passport, <laughs> believe it or not. It seems like another. I, 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 I heard you're one of the most wanted in Puerto Rico today because you know Schiff. Yeah, well, yeah, I, didn't, I, I had a bunch of issues there when I went there last. It, it got really crazy, that's for sure. They're extremely draconian about this whole uh, process with the virus and uh, definitely not the type of personal liberty and freedom that, uh, that I like. But then you say countries like around Russia who have experienced socialism and worse, yeah. they're saying, we want nothing to do with this. We want capitalism. Yeah, that's right. And and uh, there's a very anti-free market capitalist tone in the United States, to oh, say the least. Yeah. To yeah. say the least. Yeah. You know, when I say that, people say, you don't know what you're talking about. I said, man, I can feel it. Oh, yeah. I can feel it, man. It, it's, it's a lot different. I mean, and even while I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, it's just the the whole vibe is is totally changed. Not just with that, but with everything. And um, I think those countries that you mentioned, uh, they want nothing to do with it. So although they might be not as free now, right. I think you have to look at the trajectory the, of where countries are going. This in the is future. what tracks me up: is that all the people that want socialism, the people coming into the U.S. are running from socialism. Yeah, right. Do you know what I mean? And Americans will say, hey, welcome, welcome. Yeah. Because they have no idea what it is. Yeah, they don't. If they had firsthand experience, you know, a great example of that is a lot of people that work for me in Colombia with my real estate business, they're uh, from Venezuela and they mm -hmm. fled Venezuela. Right, right, yeah. right, right. So, I mean, they watch, they watch my videos right. and they absolutely love them and they see some of the comments or they see some of the things I talk about where people are actually promoting these yeah. socialist and Marxist ideas and it, it actually pisses them off. I mean, they, they, they get like angry because of what they experienced in Venezuela and having to flee and leave everything behind. And they, you know, they, they, it, it really gets them going. That's really, rightfully so. So what could somebody do today to prepare versus become a victim? Well, a lot of things. I, if we're talking about from a financial standpoint, I think you have to look at commodities because they're extremely cheap right now, historically speaking. If you Talk look about at gold and silver right now. And oil and, oil. and uranium and copper, okay. things like that, uh, agriculture. If you look at commodities as a whole relative to stocks or financial assets, we're at an all-time low going all the way back to 1900. So th that's, again, we like so to buy things buy, when they're cheap. How do you buy commodities? Because I just, we, Tim and I just buy the physical. Yeah, you can just buy producers. So as an example, if you've got, uh, you know, coal is another commodity, believe it or not, that I actually like. You know, a funny story about that is I well, tweeted. environmentalists must love you, man, I tell you. <laughs> well, listen, you know, <laughs> it's, I'm not Can't here please to. please everybody. I'm not, yeah, I'm not here to debate that. It's just about. Uh, You're just here to make a buck. Yeah, yeah, George just, if, you, if you want to make money. George you isn't gotta, running in a popularity contest. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, a quick trivia question. I think you guys will enjoy this. And I posted this on Twitter the other day. So since 1968, what do you think is the best performing stock in the entire stock market since 1968? I'm going to guess because of your lead in, it's going to be coal based. No, Altria, tobacco, cigarettes. Seriously. That's right. And the best performing sector wow. in the, the best performing uh, sector in the stock market since the mid 1990s has been tobacco. Most people would, would never, never no. ever, ever know uh -uh. that. So my, you know, what I'm trying to think through on my own now is if you look at the attitude that everyone's had towards tobacco, you know, since the mid 1990s, it's the exact same thing with coal now. So maybe coal is the new tobacco. And we look at it just from a standpoint of energy, but people forget that, that coal is a large uh, component of steel. 
So if you're bullish on the, the emerging markets developing yeah. like China and India did, then you've got to be bullish coal. Well, there's something else, you know, about uh, tobacco. I was li- reading the stats on deaths. And just before 2020 started, the estimated death rate for cancer was 606,000 Americans. Mm. And so far, coronavirus has only killed 200,000. Maybe. Yeah. So they say. So they say. You, do you know what I mean? It's so, it's so, when you look at the numbers, you kind of wonder what's going on. That's, that, that's, what, that's yeah. what I do. Yeah, we're, well, as human beings, we're extremely irrational. And that's what makes right. us so right. poor investors. Right. So we've got to try to eliminate that emotion from the equation and just look at the statistics and, and invest within a framework. But as far as what else people can do outside of, of investing and in, in looking at things that are cheap and like commodities, that by the way, will do extremely well in an inflationary environment if the Fed and the government keep creating, uh, creating money just out of, of thin air. But I think they can look around where they live and say, is, is, is my state going in the direction I want it to go? And if not, maybe I should Look at uh, a, a different state where, where they've got some ideas that are more aligned with, uh, with what I think is right. And then lastly, let's just say that you're someone that, um, that has to live in California because, I mean, they're the poster child right now for doing stupid stuff. Well, at the very, at the very least, you could have an RV, and we, we talked about this, just in your driveway. It sounds kind of silly. But look, if you've got riots coming through and you've got a little RV and a diesel truck in your uh, driveway with some food, you can just grab your family, hop in there, go up to Tahoe or, or wherever, and just ride it out for a couple weeks and then go back when you feel like it. It just gives you those yeah. options yeah. and there's no downside to it. It's like our friend Simon Black says, you know, it's, it's the, the, there's, what's your downside to having a plan B? Yeah. You know, it's interesting because we have a um, kind of a rustic resort up in Sedona. Yeah. Um, and all the hotels have been shut down all over the place. Well, we opened because exactly what you're saying. People wanted to get out of the cities. They they were driving. They were not flying. Mm-hmm. They were driving from anywhere from Utah, Idaho to um, to Sedona yeah. to get away from all the craziness. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing in St. Bart's. When I was in St. Bart's, uh, it's a little different level there. But uh, 90% of the people that I met were just there because they're like, listen, I see what's going on in the States. I want out. I don't want nothing to do with it. And a lot of people were there from California. I don't doubt that. Yeah. 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 What's your, what's your crystal ball say about the old time social problem, social programs like social security and Medicare, and then all the pensions? Cause you know, my, my pessimistic ball says they ain't going to be there. Yeah. I, I, I think they'll probably be there, but you won't be able to buy anything with your social security check. So yes, in nominal terms, you'll get your two or three thousand dollars a month, but it'll buy you a loaf of bread, because they're going to print and create so much money to make them whole, and it trickles down. It goes into inflation. It drives up consumer prices, especially if you have this move towards socialism, Marxism, or even anti-capitalism. You have to think through what that does. That reduces the amount of supply and go- or excuse me, the amount of goods and services in the economy that reduces supply. So if you have a reduced amount of supply and a greater amount of money chasing those goods and services, you have, you, yeah, you have inflation going straight up. So I think you'll be made whole, but you're not gonna be able to purchase anything with uh, that pension or that social security when, check. When you say socialism, communism, or anti-capitalism, I always think of socialism and communism as anti-capitalism. Yeah. Is there a difference? Well, I think a lot of people, in the United States wouldn't consider themselves a socialist or a communist, but, but they are, but, the, the, but they're very uh, anti free market capitalism. Okay. You know, they're, they're, they're for big government. They're for mm-hmm. a, a, a tops down type of approach. Um, and that that's to me that although you might not fit those first two categories, you definitely fit that third mm-hmm. category. So what else would you like to say to people about preparing, you know, because Kim and I have been preparing for years and years and years and years and years and it's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that you've got to own some gold. I know you talk about this all the time, 
But I think that's where gold and, and Bitcoin fit into the equation. How that, about you? I mean, I saw you finally endorse Bitcoin. <laughs> Not really. Well, I don't know if I, 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 if I endorse <laughs> it. jumped all over that one. Yeah, yeah. I, just, I just look at them as two completely separate asset classes with two different purposes, right? I think that gold is there as an insurance policy just right. to protect your purchasing power. So I say you buy gold not to get rich, but to stay rich. And then Bitcoin is more of a speculation or you've got some asymmetry there, probably a lot more upside than you have downside. So that's kind of, and, and, and it's in a unique, well, those are unique assets in that they don't have any counterparty risk. Right. And see, that's very important when you're in the everything bubble. Right. So the point, the point here is this, like, you know, guys like Max Kaiser, you know, they're so hardcore. There's only one thing is called Bitcoin, you know? They're, yeah. Yeah. You know, they're, I mean, they're hardcore and I go, I get a little spooked. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And you I, put I, all your eggs in yeah. one basket. Yeah, I don't think that's good. I, I spoke. Oh, good. Go my question is, is, and I've, I've asked every Bitcoin fanatic on our program. Yeah. Why can't I just do it myself? If you ask, every ask, you know, why can't I just mine Bitcoin by myself? Yeah. Have you ever asked, wondered that? I mean, not that I could. I can barely you use mean my a cell phone. A cryptocurrency. Yeah. A cryptocurrency. Or why can't you create a cryptocurrency? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can. you can. That's what I think. Mean, you absolutely can. They just have the network effect. Is probably what they would argue and that you're not gonna be able to create something as, as sophisticated as Bitcoin. But I think there's just as much um, to be excited about with the, the technology behind it and blockchain. Uh, it's just, again, you're, just, you're, you're comparing apples and oranges there if you look at those things compared to gold. I, I think the main thing though is we've got to figure out a way to limit the ability for the central planners to create more currency. That's what it's about. And if you look at the, the gold guys, the Bitcoin guys, we're all on the same team here. Right. And that's limiting the, the central planners from creating all of those currency units that trickle down and, and play into the campaign. How does effect. that happen? How, do, how does that happen? Well, let's, as an example, with Bitcoin, there's only 21 million of them. So if we went on to, let's say, a Bitcoin standard, I'm not okay. saying this is what we're doing. Right. I'm just, let's, let's go through a thought experiment. Well, that would prevent the Jerome Powell from coming in and taking his balance sheet from four trillion right. to seven trillion, that would prevent. And not only that, but see, a lot of uh, people on the left say, "Oh, well, yeah, that's terrible because we can't do these social programs." But what they forget is it would also make it harder for the governments to go to war. Interesting, right? Something we should all be mm -hmm. in favor of. Why is that? Why would it be harder? Because they can't print the money. So oh, the only they way that they could, the war. yeah, the only way they could go to war is if they actually tax the it. citizens first. And so if we're not on board oh, with them going to war, we're like, no, I'm not paying for that. So my final question, what drives you? I mean, you know, like you retired at 38, and we retired, Kim was 37, I was 47, but something drives us. It's not, it's not the money at this. I mean, the money's always interesting, but yeah. what drives you? What's your motivation? I think I, I enjoy challenge for sure. Like when I started the YouTube channel, it uh, e even, you know, I was just obsessing over that just as much as I obsess over macro. And that's one of the things that interests me about macro is just trying to figure out that 10 dimensional puzzle and, and trying to what's going to happen next. And it's that challenge. And uh, when we started the YouTube channel, you know, you, although it, it was never about just making it the biggest, I would never really right. admit that. But in the back of my mind, you know, I'm very competitive and I'm like, okay, what, what do we do to get more view? What do we do to do this? What do we do? So it's that, I, and, you know, and I was an athlete growing up, so I think it has something to do with that. But that, I think the pursuit of more personal freedom and always being challenged, that drives me. But, uh, that's a, that's a good but don't quest. you find that the more you do it, the more you share, the more you learn, the more freedom you have? Yeah. That's, that's the beauty of this yeah. whole thing. I mean, and let's look at this weekend with the Red Pill Ex uh, right. Expo. Now I have the opportunity to go there and hang out with you guys and meet all these other cool speakers. And that never would have happened unless I would have pushed myself to get outside of my comfort zone yeah. and challenge myself by putting myself out there and making often a fool of myself and all these YouTube As videos. we all have. <laughs> As we all have, George. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, George, it's, it's an honor to have you come yeah. by and visit the little Rich Dad Company here. Oh, we've it's been, an honor to be here. We've been shut down for a while. Everybody's been social distanced. and uh, But we're back. So but we're back. And I have to tell you, being social distanced, everybody working from home, oh my God, this team is so so tight and so hot. We've been more effective, more productive than ever before. That's great. It's just amazing. So it's opened up all sorts of opportunities as a team of what we can do together. 
So there is good that's coming out of COVID, but for your point about wanting more and more and more freedom and not losing liberties and not right. losing our freedoms, yep. that's that's what we stand for. Absolutely. So thank you for what you do. Anyway, with that, George, thank you. Congratulations thank on you all your George. success. Thanks for stepping by. And thank you all for listening to the Rich Dad Radio Show. <laughs>